Hello and welcome. This is Matthias 76. Together, we are decoding the deception, and we are continuing here in the book of Acts today. And we're on, we've got Acts 8 on the screen, but we're picking up with Acts 9. We've covered Acts 8 in the previous video, but I wanted to come back to the beginning of Acts 8 because when we think of Acts chapter 8, we think primarily about Philip and his ministry and how the Lord used him in Samaria, and then with the Ethiopian eunuch. That that is the last video. If you want to go go watch that, and the title is "Scattered with a Purpose." God scattered the church, and it says that right here. They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And why were they scattered? They were scattered because of the persecution that arose, that was spearheaded guided and directed by Saul. And so we're going to read these first three verses just to get up to speed because it talks about Saul, and then it goes to Philip and what he was doing, and then it's going to come back to Saul. And Saul approved of his execution, that being Stephen. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they all were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. And Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. That term ravaging the church, the the idea is laying waste to it. It's a, it's a military term, really. And that's what Saul was doing. That is where his heart was. We're going to see more about that as we get to chapter 9. But just a note on how the progression of the narrative in Acts works. Luke is the author, and and Luke focuses on different individuals, different groups, different events. And the big transition is, is started right here with Saul and then Saul's conversion. But it does not go straight from Saul's conversion to being all about Saul. We're going to go back after Saul's conversion, and and Peter is going to be the main player for a short time. And then, once the missionary journeys begin, Paul made three that are recorded in the book of Acts, then it is following the life and the ministry of Paul, and for most of those journeys, large parts of those journeys, Luke was with Paul. But we have this transitional section that we're in now. Starts talking about Saul. Saul's converted. He becomes Paul. And then it goes back to Peter. And then we go back all. So that's just the way the narrative goes. So let's go to Acts 9, the conversion of Saul. But Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. I'm sorry, I misread that. We'll get the, the, the proper reading here. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men, or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus. Now, we'll stop there before we get to the events of what happened. And you know, something I forgot to do was to pull up a map. Okay, so here here is our map. of We've got Jerusalem way down here at the bottom, and then up here toward the top of the map, we've got Damascus. So here's Galilee, you know, all the places up in, in, in Galilee, Capernaum, Etc. where Jesus ministered. This is well up north from there, Damascus, a a large, fairly large and important city. This is where Saul is traveling, to where Saul is traveling when his conversion takes place. And then he's going to come back down to Jerusalem later on. But that is the, the geographic information on what's going on. But what is it? Look at what it says about Saul. And again, pay close attention to the text and how it is phrased. Think beyond your own recollections of what's going on here, because we just kind of 
screws past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Saul's mad. He's going up to, to Damascus. How does it describe him? He's still breathing threats and murder, and it can be while breathing threats and murder. And th- this is these are participles here, the, the, the breathing. It, and when you think about breathing, it, it's talking about who you are at your essence, at your core. This is what is moving him. This is the driving force in his existence. And what is it? Look at the extreme hatred here. It's threats and murder. That's an ugly picture. It's an ugly picture no matter what, but especially when it is against the disciples of the Lord and the high priest, more than willing. We got this young buck willing to go out on the war path against these people because there could be potential blowback from the Roman Empire, etc., though there does that does not seem to appear. But young, eager workers out there never forget that those in power are more than willing to use you to do the dirty work so that it'll all fall on you if things come apart. The the breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues of Damascus. We saw the map. So that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? He's going up to the synagogues up in Damascus. And, and the idea here is we don't want this thing to spread. And what had happened? What did we talk about in the last chapter? Ethan is stoned, and because of Saul's persecution, everybody spreads. And as far as, as far as Saul is concerned, these are rats laying a sinking ship, and he wants to go get the rats when they land on shore before they breed and multiply. It's like getting rid of a cancer, a contagion. He wants to eliminate it. That's what he thinks he's doing. That's where his hatred and animosity is driving him. He wants to eradicate this thing. That's his aim and intent. But how are these believers referenced? How do they refer to them? Those found belonging to the way. The way. Now, it's probably here more as a a, a pejorative, a put down. These are these people who are off on that weird path because that's what a way is, right? They're off on this weird, strange, perverted, heretical path. But what did Jesus said about himself? I am the way, the truth, and the life. So the believers, and we'll see this later, they readily accept this term. You want to use it as a pejorative? Okay with us. You want to call us the way as we follow the one who is proclaimed to be the way, the truth, and the life as we represent him, as we are his body here in this world? That's, that's perfectly fine with them. And, and contrast that with their attitude and that of Paul. They're willing to accept this title. They're not trying to hide from it. They're willing to accept it. Just kind of an interesting contrast. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice and seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So he, they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. So he went on his way. And, and, and what would define his way? That rage, that antipathy, that hatred that had filled him. And no doubt, later on, we, we see Paul refer to this. We see Saul reference who he was, and and we can look at 1 Corinthians 15, 8, where he talks about himself, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. He goes on to say, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. 
but he's on his way. So we've got this, this contrasting images here. Saul's got one thing in mind. He knows what he's doing. And do you remember, some of you are young. I joke with, with people more my age often that I look back on my 20s and I remember it as this wonderful time because I knew everything. I had everything figured out. I was so wise. I, I was, you know, so impressed with myself and so confident. And, and we see that here in, in Saul. Part of it is just the nature of being young and eager and looking to promote yourself. But there's also that hatred and animosity there. You've got that on one side and what the Lord intends through this on the other. And they could not be more diametrically opposed. And you can see, even though the word isn't used here, in what state spiritually would you describe Paul to be? Would you say that he was lost, completely committed to, and delving deeper, advancing farther into the darkness of sin? How much more dark can you get than actively pursuing those who are faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ and seeking to destroy them. So as he advances confidently in that darkness, he is stunned, knocked off of his horse or whatever animal he was on with a bright light from heaven that shone around him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the light of the world, Jesus said, and he uses a bright flash of that light, might we say, representing his essence and who he is. And what happens? He knocks Saul to the ground. That one who was so confident, so sure of what he was doing, had the backing of the leaders, is now on the ground in fear. And he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The repetition, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He's, he's calling out to him. He's condemning him. He's calling him to repentance. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Do you note how that's stated? The grammar here, the pronoun, he doesn't say, why are you persecuting them? Would be more fitting, you might think. Why are you persecuting them? Why are you persecuting my followers? But he doesn't say those things. He says, why are you persecuting me. What an image that is. God's church, Christ's church that he calls his body, he is being formed in us. We represent him. He speaks of us being persecuted as him being persecuted. That's where the emphasis is. Why are you persecuting me? The powerful statement. Think about that. Fully consider what it means. What it means when, when we, because of our faith, are persecuted, when we, because of our faith, are rejected, put down, whatever. And turning that a little bit and looking at it slightly from a different angle, a slightly different angle, if I'm putting my faith out there and sharing what I believe, and it receives whatever negative response, to whom are they responding? Are they responding to me? Or are they responding to the one who dwells in me, the one whose gospel, whose word, whose truth I am representing and presenting and living. Changes our perspective on that, doesn't it? What does it matter if they persecute me? Who am I? Who am I? I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I I am redeemed, restored, and forgiven. This is is the, the words of John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace. It's on his tombstone. Talks about his sinful life before, and he says, redeemed, restored, forgiven, and appointed to preach the gospel, I once labored to destroy. Everything that I would have been for myself has been pushed to the side, all those sinful things, and the things that are there that the Lord has given me in gifting, ability, skills, whatever terminology we want to use in our in our language of the day. God uses those things and he blesses them and he wants for us to be all the things that we can be in him in which there is true fulfillment peace meaning satisfaction that there can never be without him because he made us for himself and existing in him we have fullness meaning satisfaction peace all of those things 
I'm being what he wants me to be, never perfectly, never perfectly, not here in this life, but I'm being who he wants me to be, and he blesses me in that and helps me to do it more and more and blesses my efforts on his behalf. All of that there in Christ saying to Paul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Interesting. He had no idea who it was. Saul, for all his wisdom, all his knowledge, all of his great learning, did not know the Lord. For all of his faith and zeal, he did not know the Lord. A a sobering thought. And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Same concept again. You're persecuting them. You're persecuting me. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. It's very straightforward. It's very brief. The Lord has knocked him flat. We're going to see that the Lord has blinded him with this bright light that appeared to him. And he says, now you're going to be something else altogether. Now you're going to be something else altogether. You will be told what you are to do. It's stunning in its brevity. Just direct. You're persecuting me, but rise and enter the city. Everything's changed now. Everything's changed. Your life has changed. It's rearranged. Some of you will get that reference. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. What would the Lord have you do? And we're going to talk about Saul. We're going to talk about him. We're going to spend the rest, the majority of the book of Acts, basically from chapter 13 on, talking about what the Lord had Saul do. But for for yourself, for me, it, it is we are called to think about that question. What are we to do? And, and what where might that take us? What might that involve? What changes might that entail? If the Lord is given free reign in your life, what would your life look like? What would my life look like? Am I open to that? Am I willing to contemplate it? To prayerfully say, Lord, am I being who you want me to be? Is the, is your will for my life, my purpose, my mission, what I am about, is that being fulfilled in my life or is it not? And if it is not, show me what it's supposed to be. Give me the heart that's open to receive that and preferably do that without knocking me flat. It's not any fun to get knocked flat. It's not any fun to get knocked proverbially or really get knocked off your horse by a a light that defies description that left Saul blind and will affect him the rest of his life. And we're going to see that. We'll talk about it. It's better not to go there. It's better not to go there. It's better to pray, Lord, take me, build me up, teach me, guide me, direct me. Who would you have me be? What does that look like? And give me the faith, give me the desire, give me the courage to be that and hold my hand and walk me down that road. And you will be told what you are to do. With with Saul, it was going to be very direct. We don't get it as directly, perhaps, but the Lord will tell us what we are to do. And Saul had to wait. Let's talk about that. This happens in three days. Blind. Shaken to his core. How shaken do you have to be if you're not eating and not drinking, just sitting three days? You had it all figured out. You were the man, the high priest. Everybody loved you, baby. It was wonderful. You were you were going places, and you got knocked down in the dust, and now you're left blind. Unless you think that this was some freak incident. No, you're blind. You can't see. And don't forget, it's one thing to go blind today. If I were to go blind, I can get a Braille keyboard. I, I've got software that can read things to me. None of that existed. If you were blind, you were nothing. You were nothing. Your, your life definitely is a Pharisee, definitely is a mover and climber. It was over. Who knows what all was going through Saul's mind as he went and he waited three days without sight. The men were traveling with him, stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. It's interesting. There are a number of references. You'll see him over here on the right. When the Lord appears to Daniel one time, and I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. This is from Daniel 10. The men who were with me did not see the vision, but heard, but, hold on, a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. They could sense something was going on. Other times, Paul says they heard a sound. 
that they couldn't understand it. When Jesus, in John 12, the crowd stood there and heard it and said that it had thundered, others said an angel has spoken to him, that when the father said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. The message is for Saul, and it is only for Saul. The others knew something special was going on, and they'd seen the light, but it hadn't affected them. It wasn't focused on him. So Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Don't let that slide by. Look at what he had been. Just moments before, he was going places. He was a mover. He was a shaker. He was going to squash this rebellion, and who knows what that meant for him moving forward, what it would do for his stature and standing. And now, like a young child, trembling and afraid, unable to see, he has to be led by the hand. God will humble you. If that's what it takes, God will humble you. And it is no fun. I have been humbled by God. It's not any fun. I am thankful for it. But as I teach others and remind myself, it's okay with me if I don't get humbled again. But God will humble you if he needs to. If that's what he has to do to save you, to bring you back, to turn you around, he will humble you. But pursue him. Allow him to speak to you, to move you, to guide you and direct you where he would have you go and spare yourself this. You don't want to be led by the hand into Damascus where you sit in a room in your own darkness for three days waiting for God to speak, waiting to find out what comes next because the Lord hadn't said much. This is all he says. I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. Nothing. That's it. Done. Wait. And Saul waited. He waited three days. How long can three days be? Three days can be a really long time. It's that, That's worth some just personal thought, prayerful contemplation. What might Saul have been thinking? What? And again, to serve his purpose, to serve your own good, Saul's own good. Where was Saul going? Saul was racing at high speed down the highway to hell. That's where Saul was going. The deepest circle of hell for those who persecute the church and rage against it and would destroy it. That's where Saul was going of his own free will and volition. Full speed. Damn the torpedoes. Here I go. And God grabbed him and said, no, there's something else for you. And so we waited. Sometimes we wait. I want answers. I wait. I wait. God doesn't tell me. God doesn't make it clear. He says that in the waiting, there is humility. In the waiting, there is learning. In the waiting, there is perspective. Think of 40 years in the wilderness that the children of Israel had to wait until they got to enter the promised land. Plenty of time for contemplation. Plenty of time for self-reflection. Waiting. It's a difficult thing. And this three days probably seemed to be 40 years to Saul without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now, I'm going to point this out now, and I think it's important I don't take credit for having figured, I don't, hello, 38 minutes in, 38 minutes, or now I'll be able to find it. I don't take credit for figuring this out on my own. I wish I had, and I haven't heard it from all that many people. It's from my my beloved Greek professor, and uh, he was more than just a Greek professor. He was a theologian. Professor Charles Fraley, who pointed this out, he was without sight. Later, to the Galatians, Saul was going to say with them to them, first of all, in 4.15, what then has come, let's, let's just go look at it. What then has come of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. That's a strange phrase. I, I, I can't think of a setting in which I would say to somebody, you, you were so indebted to me, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Why? Why the eyes? What, what is this? And then at the end of the letter, because people had been trying to deceive the Galatians, claiming to be apostles, some claiming to be Paul, he says, see with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. So that, in Greek, written very large. We all know that Saul had other people write his letters. 
But here, he scrawled this out in great big 32 font in the Greek alphabet, so they knew it was him. I'm the guy who has lousy eyesight. I'm the guy who has to have other people write for me. I'm the guy whose eyes give him trouble. Later, we're going to see that something like scales fell from his eyes. And then when he talks about the, the superabundance of blessings that he received and talking with the Corinthians, as he lays that all out, he says this, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, all the things that God was going to do, take him up into the second heaven where he saw and heard things that he can't begin to describe, the things that the Lord was going to do in his own personal education, his three years in the wilderness, learning from the Lord Jesus just as the other apostles had. So to keep him from becoming conceited about that, maybe from a guy who was prone to be conceited, remember who that young man on the road to Damascus was? The core essence of our own weaknesses, they don't go away. They come back and plague us again and again. A thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. And in the King James, I love it's to buffet me. If you're in a small boat out at a storm and see you're buffeted, you're bounced this way and down, bounced the other. But a thorn in the flesh. Have you ever had something wrong with your eyes, even just a scratched cornea, something like that? How much it hurts, how much discomfort there can be? I think a strong case can be made by the passages that we just looked at based on what takes place in Acts 9, that Paul suffered all his life long from issues with his eyes. Just food for thought. God doesn't always take away the bad things. He doesn't. When it suits his purposes, which is the advance of the gospel and the glory of his name, he does. But sometimes his purpose and his glory is promoted and advanced by us being faithful through adversity, persecution, suffering, and illness. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen a vision, in a vision, a man named Ananias coming to him and laying his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. We'll stop there. I love Ananias. And we just have this little glimpse of Ananias, but there's so much that we can learn. He was a disciple, and the Lord appeared to him, and what does he say? Here I am. Here I am. What a response of faith. It's not just an answer. It's not just saying, hello, yo, hey, how you doing? Here I am. When the Lord high God, the Lord of hosts, reaches out to you and speaks directly to you, here I am, says, I'm here to serve. You are the Lord. And, and I am the servant, what, what possible use can I be to you, dear Lord? And, and for examples of that, Genesis 22, 1. After these things, God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, and he said to him, here I am. Abraham was going to be called on to sacrifice Isaac. Isaiah 6, 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then I said, here I am send me. And he said, go and say to this people, and he gives him the, the commission. He gives him the commission that, that Jesus references in his ministry about them not hearing, etc. But go, and he, here I am, send me. There's a beautiful Spanish contemporary Christian song by a guy named Marcos Witten. It's called Amy Aki, and if you want to look it up, it's H-E-M-E-A-Q-U-I. Amy a key, and the song is Amy a key, yo eré, senor. Here I am, Lord, I will go. It's a beautiful, beautiful song, easy to figure out the Spanish, 
but it's, it is a, a prayer to the Lord. Here I am, send me. And that is our response of faith. Lord, what would you have me do? And Ananias is going to go, oh, wait, I'm just curious. Because this guy that you want me to go talk to, he came here to kill me. That's what he's saying. It's very respectful. The Lord says, rise, go to the street called Straight. I love that street. It, 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 he envisioned that Damascus was all these winding, twisting streets, but there was one that was straight, and they called it Straight Street. And, and there at the house of Judas, Saul of Tarsus, behold, he is praying, and he's seen a vision. It's near the end of those three days, perhaps, Saul has seen this vision of a man named Ananias coming and laying his hands on him so that he might regain his sight, regain but not have more than likely fully restored, or at very least to be subject at times to the bouts of real issues. But Ananias just says, Lord, I, I know, notice what he doesn't say. That's probably the best place to start. He doesn't say, what are you talking about? He doesn't say, I don't want to do that. He just makes clear. It's almost kind of like clarifying that this is the guy we're talking about, right? Lord, I've heard from many about this man. No, everybody knew. News spread. They didn't have Facebook, Twitter. Everybody knew what was going on. Everybody knew what was happening. And everybody knew apparently that Saul was on his way. And here's Ananias. He gets this message go drop by for a cup of tea with that guy. How much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. Everybody knew. Everybody had heard about Stephen. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Again, some of you out there perhaps have been in a situation, a place in your life, a time where real persecution because of your faith existed. I have not. Ananias was. Ananias was. And he gets told, there's this den of lions. I want you to walk into it. And the biggest one's named Saul. And I want you to pat him on the head and tell him to behave. It's basically what he's being told. But the Lord said to him, go. It's simple. It's direct. Go. God sends us to do things we would rather not do. God gives us a message to share at times that others don't want to hear. And his message is, go. And Ananias' response had been, here I am. Abraham got told to sacrifice his son Isaac, and he was going to do it. The knife was raised. Isaiah was being sent to a people that he's told at the outset, go read verses 9 and on in Isaiah 6. Read the whole scene because it's this amazing call that God gives to his, his prophet Isaiah during that throne room scene. Go to these people who aren't going to listen to you. Isaiah is told, they're not going to listen. You're going to say amazing things through me. You're going to, and they're not going to listen. They're not going to respond. Then got closed ears, all those things. And what did Isaiah do? He spent the rest of his life going and proclaiming and sharing and writing, and for the most part, they didn't listen. But to Ananias, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Keep that phrase in mind. Probably one worth making a mental note. 9.15, pretty much the theme we talk about, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. That ends of the earth part, that's Paul. The others too, but the book focuses on Paul because you have these concurrent mission outings going on that we don't hear about. But to Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, think of that where he would go to the synagogue first, where he comes back to Jerusalem and gets arrested and gets sent off to Rome there at the end of the book. He's my chosen instrument. What a high and holy calling. And Ananias is supposed to go and inform him of this, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. We suffer for the name, and, and we want to believe in a theology of glory, that it's all roses, that everything's good, and we're blessed. We, wanna, we make the mistake of thinking that because of the comfort of our lives, the blessings that we have, the intelligence we have, the skill set that we're able to sell to other people for this stuff called money, and with that money, we're able to buy nice things or have piles of money that make us feel comfortable and, and safe and secure, we think that that's because we're blessed by God. And, and in some ways, it is. But God might call on us. He may be calling on us to do something else, and it might involve suffering. It's not a theology of glory. I want to believe in a theology of glory. I want it to apply to my life. 
because I like stuff, I like money, and I like comfort. Don't want to get out of my comfort zone. The theology of the cross is something else. The theology of the cross is what we see in Jesus Christ. The theology of the cross is made up of three S's. Three S's. The theology of the cross calls on us in service. We serve. We serve the Lord. We follow him. He says, go and we go. He says, be like me, and, and we live like him. We share him with others. That requires sacrifice. It might require sacrifice of our comfort. It might require putting our comfort into peril and threat, because if we follow him, there might be consequences to that. Service leads to sacrifice, and sacrifice, it always involves suffering. If we're living a Christian life in which there is, where our service isn't seen at all in the light of sacrifice and suffering, chances are we're missing something. We're doing something wrong. We're selling the whole thing short. We're holding back. We're like the the rich young man whom Jesus said, and I'm not saying you have to not have any material possessions or anything like that. You can look behind me. There are material possessions. I got my books. I got my stuff. Got a bunch of stuff because I just had to move it when we moved. I know how much stuff I have. Um, But the rich young man came to Jesus and he said, you know, he laid out the faith. He said, Jesus said, you got it. Love the Lord of God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. One thing you lack, sell everything you have and come and follow me. And the young man went away sad. Now, Jesus called on that man directly to do that, but it showed where his heart was. He was willing to give this much, but not more. He was all excited about knowing the faith, knowing the truth. Now, give all that other stuff away and come follow me. And, and let's understand there were special circumstances, like God himself was there in the person of Jesus Christ, and he said, come follow me. And this guy said, no. He went away sad because he had great possessions. Saul, become Paul, was going to be shown how much he had to suffer for the sake of Christ's name. And read through, I challenge you, read through the ministry of Paul, just in Acts, let alone looking at the epistles and the things he talks about. It's suffering. He gets stoned, he gets beaten, he gets kicked out of town, he gets rejected by the Jews. He has to leave and go to this place, from that place to this place. They conspire against him repeatedly. That was his entirety of his life, and then he gets his head cut off in the end. And Saul didn't regret a bit of it. Paul would not regret a bit of it. Why? Because he was called, because he was chosen, he was appointed. And what does Ananias do? He goes. He was told, he asked his questions, and then, here I am, send me. And so he went. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. Again, last thought on on Ananias. Tremendous faith. He was told to go and he goes. I point this out often with the different players and characters in Scripture. Abraham was told to go and he went. Isaiah called to go and he went. We can go on and on and on and on. Moses complained and grumbled a while, but then he went and was faithful. Multiple, multiple, multiple examples. It's what faith leads us to do. And again, what might your faith lead you to do if you ask? He goes in the house and he lays his hands on him. No preamble, not messing around. And what does he call him? Brother, brother. You know, we throw around the term bro, hey, you know, whatever. It's it's, it's like dude, hey, guy, hey, person, acquaintance, person I just met, whatever. No, I don't. I'd be kind of silly for a two-year-old man to walking around saying, bro. But this was a term of endearment. It was a term of acceptance. Saul had been brought into the family, and Ananias makes no bones about it. He calls him brother. He lays his hands on him and says, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared. There is no doubt about it, and I've got all the references over here. Don't have time. Been going on for a while. Don't have time to look at them, but numerous references make it clear Saul saw Jesus in this appearance. And you can look here in 927, which is, or actually, 
uh, which one? We're not in 927 yet. In 927, we've got this where he says he appeared. Okay. Same chapter when Barnabas takes him into Jerusalem because the disciples are afraid of him, even the apostles, they wouldn't talk to him. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him. And this is important. We talked about Isaiah. Prophets have to have a call in which they visibly see the Lord. Why do you think Isaiah saw what he saw? And we can go through the Old Testament and point out multiple examples who appeared to Moses, who appeared to Abraham, appeared. Physical form appeared. Okay, The Lord appearing to Paul on the road to Damascus was his Paul. And then he's going to spend time with him out in the wilderness where the Lord instructs him. Acts 22, there, and when Paul is talking about his conversion, let's see, where is it in there? Oh, it's at the end there, verse 14. I'm looking for the word see. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. That's talking about seeing him. It's talking about a call. And they understood it in that context. They knew prophets had to have a call. Verse 16 of chapter 26, but rise and stand on your feet for I have appeared to you for this purpose. There in Acts 26, Paul gives a lengthier explanation of what appeared to him, what transpired there on the road in the Damascus in, in Acts 9. He was called. Special thing that God appeared to him. He's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he goes to work right away. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes. We've talked about that previously, about how his eyes were going to be an issue throughout his life. But we've got this thing that's interesting. This wasn't just some spiritual thing that he was kept from being able to see for a time. Something went wrong with his eyes. Something like scales fell from his eyes. Now think about that for a minute. How do you envision that? Draw a picture in your mind. I can't draw a picture for anything. Thank goodness for AI. Sometimes I use it for my thumbnails to generate thumbnails. How do you draw scales falling from your eyes? What does that look like? What would those things what would those things be? But there again, that concept with there's going to be some kind of a vision thing that he was going to suffer from for the rest of his life. I knew a guy back in the days, and some of you were old enough to remember, when there were hard contacts, not the soft ones that you put in that you take out each day and throw away they're disposable. Contacts were hard. And one thing you didn't do was fall asleep with them in, because they'd stick. And when they came off, they took part of your eye with them. And I knew a guy, he was a pastor, who had, when he was in college, made the mistake. He was sick and he fell asleep with his contacts in, slept with them in for like, I don't know, multiple hours, like longer than you would usually sleep in a night. And he had vision problems the rest of his life because those getting those hard contacts out messed up his eyes. That's what I think of when I think of Saul and his eyesight and how that was going to be something that he had to be dealt with, had to deal with the rest of his life. But what does he do? He rose and was baptized right away. And we'll be talking about baptism a lot as, as we move along, but it is a response of faith. It is also a means of grace by which we're brought to faith in many instances, but it is also a response of faith. And he rose and was baptized and taking food he was strengthened. Now we're going to stop there. And what we're going to see next when we move along, what we're going to see is how Saul goes to work. That zeal that seems to define him is a characteristic God intends to use in his intense desire to spread the gospel. Nothing was going to stop this guy. He was tenacious. And now that skill that he had, that personality trait that he had, that had been used in warring against the church, now in full blessing, being used as God intended it in service to the church, is going to take Paul to the very ends of the earth, definitely by his understanding and perception of, of geography. So we're going to stop there. We'll be back next time with the rest of Acts 9 and more. Do hope that this teaching, that this ministry is a blessing to you. I invite you. I encourage you. Share it with others. Give it a thumbs up. 
give it a like, promote it, help me spread the word. You are the best way that I can do that. This is Matthias 76. Together, we are decoding the deception. God bless and have a great day.